This is not a pleasant psalm. It uh, is quite disturbing, especially at the end, so brace yourself a little bit. We're going to take a look in, and uh, reflect on, on it, but uh, just brace yourself a little bit. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If you do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. That's Psalm 137. There's a context here. This comes from a particular kind of person in a particular kind of place. Um, if you know the story of the Old Testament, you know that uh, the Jewish people were exiled to Babylon. It was, uh, they had failed the Lord, they had turned to idols, they were worshiping those idols in horrible ways, and so God says, I'm going to hand you over to Babylon. So Babylon came and conquered them, and the people were deported to Babylon. And this song, it's a song, it's a, by a conquered, deported prisoner, essentially. Somebody who is helpless, far away from home, and maybe doesn't know if he will live to see a return. And uh, being a prisoner there, you're relocated to an enemy's homeland. It's bad enough that you're conquered, but it's far worse that you have to be relocated and to your enemy's homeland. And exile, I just want to drive home this point. Exile was kind of like an ancient equivalent of genocide. Exile is a deliberate attempt to, to destroy a way of life. Babylon deporting people from Jerusalem was Babylon's attempt to completely wipe out the Jewish people as a people. It's a way that you can destroy the Jewish culture, their way of life, everything about them. So the idea is you get your defeated peoples to come to your, your land. You know, they study in your schools, they speak your language, they worship your gods, they intermarry with your kids, and they become you. And their culture, their people, their way of life, their religion, that goes away. That's what exile is about. And so here you have somebody who is from Jerusalem, a Jewish person who's far off with the intent that his whole way of life and his people just be gone. They become Babylonian. Babylon had completely destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. When Babylon came and conquered, they destroyed it completely. And I may have mentioned this before, but um, there is no evidence that we have or no artifacts that we have left over from that temple period. There's one that's arguably something, but it's not conclusive. They destroyed it completely and entirely. And Jerusalem was leveled. Temples were residences of the gods. So no matter where you were, you know, every nation, every city, they had temples, right? And that's where their gods were, and that was what protected your city. The gods are here, they're going to protect our city. So if you conquered another city or a nation, you made sure to destroy their temple. That was a sign that our gods are stronger than your gods, and your gods can't even defend themselves. So, gone. 
So it's super humiliating for a people to see their temple destroyed, and that's what Babylon is going to do. We're going to destroy your temple and show you that your God can't protect you. A destroyed temple means a defeated God. Verse 8, they saw Babylon slaughter their infants. I mean, it says, it says right that in verse 8. This is what they had done to us. When Babylon came, they, they had no mercy. They had no mercy at all. It says, blessed be, shall he be who repays you from what you have done to us. Warfare does have a way to lead to unbridled cruelty. And it was very much the case back then. And this happens even in modern times as well. Um, there, there are just terrible things. If you read about the Holocaust, you've heard of stuff like this. But even, even in more recent times, there are just terrible things that go on in warfare. Stuff like this. In verse 7, there's a reference to, Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, how they said, Lay it bare down to its foundations. Okay, if you know, if you know Edom, Edom is the kinsman of Judah and Jerusalem. And they celebrated Jerusalem's collapse. They're, they're kind of like cousins. They're, they're kin. Edomites, the Edomites come from Esau who was the brother of Jacob, later renamed Israel. And so the Edomites are Esau's descendants, and Judah and Jerusalem are Israel's descendants. So they, they're related. They're, they're kin. And so in verse 7, you can feel, you can feel some pain there of, of like a family betrayal there. They were gloating, and they were rejoicing in the destruction of our, of our city and our our, our home. And so there's, there's that pain there. So they had their kinsmen turn on them and gloat and rejoice. In verse 3, the captors, now that they're there, they mock them by asking them to sing some of the Zion songs. This is a mockery. Their temple was destroyed. Hey, sing, sing us some of those songs about how wonderful your God is. In his temple. Sing us some of those songs. It's a gloating. It's another way of, of uh, twisting the knife, if you will, pouring salt into the wounds of your God either is not strong enough to defend you or he doesn't care about you. Sing us some of those songs about how wonderful Zion is, the one that's leveled, you know? It's really cruel to do that. The songs of Zion, it says here, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How are we going to do that? How can we sing about how wonderful God is in Zion? The songs of Zion celebrated God in His temple. And they were about God's power to protect. And they were about how God is going to keep His people in His good care. And then... You know, I hear some examples here. Psalm 46, 4 and 5. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God's with us, so we're, we're safe. And uh, Psalm 48. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. It's glorying in God's presence here. Or how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. This is a destroyed and burned temple. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. How can we sing these songs? When our temple is destroyed, we are far away from our homeland, and everything around us says God either isn't strong enough to defend us, or He doesn't care about us. It was just an awful place to be, an awful position to be in. Verses 5 and 6, the singer here kind of makes a pledge to hold Jerusalem in his heart. 
where it said, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, then let my right hand forget its skill, and let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth, if I do not remember you. It's kind of like, let, let me be cursed if, if I forget you, Jerusalem. And this is especially a uh, especially key curse for somebody who sings and makes music. Then let my right hand forget the skill and let my tongue be unable to sing anymore. So for a singer, this is an especially uh, bad thing to happen. But what he's basically saying is that all my skill and my music and as wonderful as that is, it's not better than my home. And not only home, but where God dwells. They were not only far from home, but since God's presence for them was through the temple in Jerusalem, being separated from Jerusalem was basically being separated from God. You and I, as Christians, we are not too far removed from somebody singing in Babylon like that. You and I, we are exiles in this world at this time. This world is not our home. This, we're citizens of the United States, but really, this is just a temporary kingdom for a short time until the real kingdom comes. We're citizens of a kingdom that is still coming. We are exiles awaiting a return. We hold a heavenly Jerusalem in our heart now as exiles here. So in this world where there's, where there's sin, where there's trouble, a world that is basically a sworn enemy of God, we are holding a heavenly Jerusalem in our hearts. It says in Revelation at the very end, it says, I see the heavenly Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And that will happen someday. That's the Jerusalem in our heart. Philippians 3 verse 20 says it this way, Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you and I, we sing songs about a coming kingdom. A kingdom that we're not currently in, but one that is definitely going to come. And will hopefully come soon. And then verse 9, let's just call verse 9 what it is. Verse 9 is simply horrifying. This is, just, this is just awful. And especially since it ends right there, um, it, it just kind of leaves you with that, with that awful image. And this is just, this is just awful. C.S. Lewis has a book, Reflections on the Psalms, and he refers to this as devilish. Um, and the fact that verse 9 doesn't call for this to happen, but... It still blesses the one who does. That doesn't really help us out that much at all. But this is a, this is a psalm that, that always kind of hits me wrong when I read it. Like, what is God thinking, putting this in here? What are we supposed to get out of this? Well, I think on the first, the first level to consider here is that verse 9 reflects Human anger over what an enemy had done to them. This is said by somebody who is very angry because this had been done to him and to his people. It's easy for us to condemn savage hatred like this when it's never been done to us. It's easy when when you live in the time and place where we do. But these sorts of things still go on to this day. One uh, place is uh, Nigeria. Um, there, are, there are places in Nigeria, particularly northern Nigeria, where, where um, there are Fulani herdsmen who are Muslim, and they are raiding Christian villages. And they're doing it on kind of a steady basis. And I see headlines. You know, this, this doesn't make the, the mainstream media, of course, but, but uh, certain sources are reporting what goes on there. And it's stuff as awful as this. And it's 
just awful to think of having to be in that situation. But these are our brothers and sisters in Christ that this is happening to. And you and I, we, we get angry too. Maybe not this angry, but we get angry. And how do we handle that anger? I mean, that's kind of an important question. It's considered impolite in our circles to get angry at somebody else. So typically we, we hold it in until we can't hold it in anymore and then it just kind of blows up at some point. That's kind of the way it usually works, but when, when we're angry, it's right and proper for us to give this to God in prayer. It's right to give our hearts hatreds or angers to God in prayer. That's what this is doing. When you're angry with somebody, when we are angry with somebody, it's good to just let it out to God. To just give it over to God. God, I am so mad at this person. I, I, hope, that you, I hope that you remember them when it comes time for, for judgment or whatever. You know? God is a safe place to vent your anger. And that doesn't mean He's going to do it. But what I've found is that when you're angry with somebody else and you just pour that out to God, you're basically giving over your anger to God who is just. And He will take care of it. Like it says, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And in doing so, on the contrary, if our enemy is hungry, we feed him. If he's thirsty, we give him something to drink. Because we give our anger over to the Lord. As horrendous as verse 9 is, this was common in ancient warfare. It was kind of standard if you were conquering some other place. It was pretty standard that you did this. And the idea was is that if you kill the enemy's children, they won't grow up and avenge their parents' deaths. So if... If you don't, if you don't, uh, if you don't get them when they're, they're weak, they're going to grow up and they're going to come after you. I mean, that's part of the idea there. There's also a part of, you know, cutting off their future. But there's nothing especially vindictive about this. As awful as it is, it's not like this is going above and beyond. This was what happens when... People are conquered. Not that it's right or good, but this is kind of standard. Actually, verse 9, this, this I kind of, uh, I didn't put this together before studying it this week, but verse 9 here actually uses God's own description of Babylon's fall. God through Isaiah used this very language to describe Babylon's fall. And this psalmist is basically saying, I want God's coming judgment to come upon Babylon. Blessed be the one who does this. And so this is quite, this is kind of disturbing that God would pronounce this judgment or this kind of judgment on somebody else. That's not very, that's not... Uh, that's kind of unsettling, we'll put it that way. But I guess what, what I walked away from that is that, yes, sin is that awful. It's that bad. Sin is not a small matter. It's not just something that you can just forget about. It's this bad. Sinning is... The equivalent of dashing an infant's head against the rocks. That's how awful it is. And it's easy for us to, you know, dismiss our sin or say, well, you know, I was in this special circumstance and, you know, it's not really that bad. I just told a white lie or, you know, something like that. But it's really this bad. This is how bad sin is. And it's especially noteworthy that God Himself watched His own Son die for our sins. 
in a way that is much more brutal and cruel than this. If you have to compare one and the other, but this, this is the more humane way when you compare it to crucifixion. And God, the Father, had to watch that. And I think you can make a good case to say that God, the Father, having to watch it happen, had it a whole lot worse than the Son did, who was actually going through it. There's a lot of parents who I've heard seeing their, their kids suffer and the parents would say, I wish it were me instead. And just hearing that a number of times, I think it's pretty safe to say that God the Father had it worse than the Son on the cross. God himself had to watch that. If you and I, if we cringe at an innocent child's violent death, how much more should we cringe at the innocent Son of God's violent death? He was more innocent than any human being ever. His death was more violent than the one that this describes. If we cringe at this, how much more should we cringe when we read the story of the crucifixion? Or when we think about what our Lord went through on our behalf? That's worse. It's far worse. We usually don't think of it that way, but it is. It's far worse that Jesus dies on a cross than this. If we cringe at this, we should be cringing all the more when we think about what our Savior did to save us. And when you think about this, this is how awful our sin is. We were under this punishment. This was us. But Jesus took it for us. Jesus took a punishment as awful as this so that we wouldn't have to go through it. That we are saved from this. As awful as this is, this is what God saved us from. And I'm going to close here just by reading 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Our Lord, our Lord Jesus loves us enough to go through that and the Father was loving enough to let his Son go through that so that we could be saved and we wouldn't have to go through it at all. That's Psalm 137. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our Father, thank you for being a God who, who loves. Loves us enough that you would let your own Son take the punishment for us. And Lord Jesus, you would go through that so that we could be saved. So something as awful as our sin could be paid for. Not by us, but by you instead. Lord, Fill us with gratitude in our hearts for what you've done for us, how much you've taken upon yourself so that we could be saved. And Lord, may we always glory in this salvation. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.